you could say this is the new normal mining sector uh, in many ways. And on your point on inflation, Sam, I would sort of totally agree that that's my number one concern is that um, we're going to see soaring lithium prices along with other transition metals, including copper. And that, was, that for me, is the biggest threat um, to the, the energy transition. Um, but for investors, you know, the biggest threat is the biggest opportunity if you're buying the metals and the materials miners. Um, you can be on the right side of that trade. Welcome to the Exponential Investor Podcast. Want to be a better, smarter, more clued up investor? Well, you've come to the right place. We cover the breakthrough investment ideas you don't hear about in the mainstream to keep you on top of the mega trends and opportunities reshaping our world. Good morning and welcome to the Exponential Investor Podcast. I am your editor, Sam Volkring, here with my co-editor, Kit Winder. Thanks for joining us again this week, Kit. So let's dive straight into everything. Um, I want to cover a couple of things, uh, a couple of different things this week. There's been some interesting moves in the British market uh, that I'd like to get your views on and see what you think about that and some uh, interesting uh, I guess activity taking place over in China, um, which we will we'll, we'll get to in a in a minute. Um, the first thing that I noticed this week, I, I saw a a report about a, uh, a a private mining company that had uh, backing investment from. Now the article had, had mentioned uh, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and uh, somebody else that was a multi billionaire. Um, realistically, it was actually through Gates's investment fund, the, the his uh, what is it the his green energy fund? I can't remember exactly what it's called. Uh, same with Bezos's um, fund. You know, these guys have got funds coming out of their uh, orifices, really, when it comes to investing in different parts of uh, different industries around the world. Anyway, the um, the the deal this 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 mining company did was it's like a partnership, I think, agreement with uh, Blue Jay Mining, which is a London listed company that is mining for uh, materials, for metals, uh, for electric vehicles, for EVs. Now, uh, with your good self being all over the uh, green energy transition and, and EVs and the associated technologies around the transition, um, I want to get your sort of take on on how you see the the British market, um, the companies listed on the London Stock Exchange, around the this sort of idea of the materials that need to go into this energy transition, um, because we know that you know the transition is taking place. Um, it's you know rammed down our throats every other or every day, really, from all forms of media and the government. Um, so it's not like it's going away. But uh, how do you see it? So a lot of people talk about you know when when there are great opportunities like this, you can invest in companies, but then you can also invest in the picks and shovels, so to speak, of the gold rush. Um, which it seems like you know that's the kind of approach with these metals and and mining companies is that the the materials going into the transition are the so called picks and shovels of this opportunity. So I'd like to get your thoughts on yeah what what do you well, you know is this is this deal something that's uh, caught your attention or or what other you know areas on the London Stock Exchange are there for for the metals and materials and and everything that goes into the energy transition? Well, yeah, so. It's obviously a, a very important consideration because uh, sort of the first criticism that I hear uh, of the energy transition these days is how material intensive it's going to be. Uh, and not only how material intensive it's going to be in terms of the actual quantity of lithium, nickel, cobalt and all the rare metals and copper that we're going to need, but yeah. also how fossil fuel intensive it is to get those things out of the ground at the moment. Right. Now, um, the transition includes, um, I guess, changes in mining technology. So whether that's uh, something like direct lithium extraction, which is much more environmentally friendly, or hydrogen fuel cell powered uh, mining equipment, diggers uh, and heavy equipment like that, uh, which is happening, or just electrification of the mining vehicles that you need. Um, over time, that will become less true, the fossil fuel intensity. But for now, it definitely is. And it's also you know, the sort of sustainability trend that we're on, which encompasses the energy transition and climate change, isn't just about carbon emissions and fossil fuels. It's also about, you know, not digging up the Amazon to buy, uh, to mine for lithium for your electric batteries. That's a sort of, that's not 
necessarily a net gain or you know child labor for cobalt in the democratic republic of congo doesn't you know not every not everything is worth doing in order to mine materials for the energy transition if you see what i mean um so you're right to point mm. out that it's a hugely critical sector and uh, in terms of the you know the bezos back deal going for blue jay mining it's not a sort of massive surprise to see so in terms of publicly listed transition material miners there are there's a decent number but there's not a huge number and a lot of them are sort of prospective so there are projections for lithium demand ranging from 30 to 300 times over the next uh 30 years going to 2050 so is there is there capacity to to uh meet those numbers now or is it that there's just going to have to be so much more supply come on board can that be achieved or is it that there's just simply not going to be enough um, you know, in January, I remember on this, this podcast, we spoke about lithium stocks and we asked the question, is it too late for lithium stocks? I mean, here we are, what now, seven months down the track. Um, you know, what are, what are your thoughts around the lithium play? I think, isn't, isn't, there like, isn't there like lithium mining supposed to be taking place in Cornwall or something like that? Um, where do you, what, what do you see happening in the lithium market? Like from the big, big players, will they, will they meet that demand? Can they increase the supply or are we just going to run headfirst into a gigantic uh supply shortage which in my mind then drives up the cost of batteries uh i would have i would have thought and and makes evs and associated uh ev technologies more expensive i mean where 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 does this sort of where does this head if we're talking three to 30 to 300 times increase can that be met yeah well i think it's sort of um as with everything there'll be supply side and demand side responses to if there's a surge in demand you know supply will catch up for a bit but it will be a massive struggle i think definitely now we are nowhere near um supplying the lithium that we're going to need let's say in five years and you know unimaginable to think where we'll be in 15 years time but what's happening is all over the world projects are being launched to try and sort of find and extract lithium and it's not a quick process uh james and i are are invested in in uh one or two and it is a very sort of long and complex process there's a pre-feasibility study there's a feasibility study there's mapping there's financing it takes you know anywhere between three and seven years i guess um to get something like this off the ground so in terms of so it's it's basically like it's basically like the normal mining sector. Yes, you could say this is the new normal mining sector uh, in many ways. And on your point on inflation, Sam, I would sort of totally agree that that's my number one concern is that um, we're going to see soaring lithium prices along with other transition metals, including copper. And that, was, that for me, is the biggest threat um, to the, the energy transition. Um, but for investors... You know, the biggest threat is the biggest opportunity if you're buying the metals and the materials miners. Um, you can be on the right side of that trade, I think. And if you look at, you know, this factors in to all the stuff we've spoken about previously in terms of inflation. And when you look at um, the strategies that have performed best in inflationary periods over the last sort of 80 or 100 years, energy commodities are uh, at the top, actually, uh, above even sort of gold and silver, the traditional inf- inflation protection uh, that people would go towards. But energy commodities have done really well in inflationary periods and so one of the things that i i spent a bit of time looking at earlier this year was what are the new energy transition commodities and it is things like you know copper and lithium mainly or cobalt and nickel secondarily um depending on the changes in battery composition that come through but for now that's that's still the case yeah it's it's a interesting sector and i, and I know a lot of people get quite uh excited about mining companies because you know if they can you know if they've got a tenement and they've got feasibility studies and they can you know hit uh, a major discovery uh, or, or some of their results comes back with particularly rich um i guess rich dirt whichever you know whichever material or or metal that they're mining for um you know they can shoot shoot up like biotech companies with a successful trial result um, so there's a lot of you know excitement and volatility and you know up and of course downside risk when it comes to mining companies, and um, yeah as as you sort of spoke about 
uh, there, you know, it is a long process, and I think people don't necessarily understand that the the average sort of length of time for a mining company to go from discovery to actual production um, can start to stretch into double digits in terms of years. Um, and so, whether it be, you know, some of these key uh, key materials, like you know, copper, cobalt, um, lithium, uh, and then some of the more you know harder to well, harder economically to to find, um, not necessarily harder to find, just harder economically to get out uh, rare earths. Um, you know, it can be a particularly long process uh, for start to finish. So there's plenty of ups and downs, but that means plenty of opportunities to get in, take profit, um, maybe look to other opportunities in the sector. But it's certainly something I think to keep an eye on. I think the, the Blue Jay mining deal has um, certainly caught a few headlines. You know, big backers or big backers from funds that are backed by big backers. There's a lot of people backing different things um and uh, i think they're heading up to greenland to do their mining um which would be cold uh nonetheless a lot happening in that sector which is really interesting now something else i wanted to sort of talk about which is kind of related to this as well is that it seems that uh china is going into serious lockdowns again um and they are absolutely stripping out the airline industry in the asia pacific region where um, I think it was something like a 10% or 11% drop off in airline flights uh, just in the last week compared to last. Uh, of course, when you get a mass drop off in uh, airline flights, in, in demand, well, obviously supply of airline flights, then the demand for oil, uh, particularly in that region, uh, is going to fall off a cliff. Um, and we've seen oil go on a bit of a rally uh, in the last few months. So I was just wondering to get your thoughts on, you know, is is this something that we should be maybe worried about too much or is it, you know, obviously hard to predict as to how long, you know, these areas get locked down for. Australia is still under pretty serious uh, lockdowns and not a lot of flights going in and out of the country there, uh, if any at all. Uh, the US demand, you know, flights have seemingly increasing and demand is picking up there. Um, but the aviation industry in, in China and Asia seems to be yeah falling off a cliff. Uh, what what do you see that doing to to oil and does that you know does that have a positive impact on the energy markets, uh, energy transition markets, the green energy markets, or is it sort of separate to all of that? No, Sam, definitely yeah. it has a massive impact. The relationship between I guess the traditional energy markets, fossil fuels, oil and gas, and the energy transition. Um, they're obviously closely linked and there's sort of two competing ideas. Is it that, you know, a high oil price uh, makes it competitive uh, or, or sort of more competitive to invest in renewables? Or is it the case that, you know, a high oil price, what it's actually doing is filling the coffers of the companies that are the biggest investors in new technologies and in, you know, renewable energy farms, which, you know, surprisingly enough is still sort of Shell and BP or some of the the biggest, you know, the big oil and energy majors, they know they have to transition and they are, they are huge investors in, in the transition. So it's a sort of a two way street, really. I think the, the interesting thing is whether, as we were talking about earlier, you start to see inflation in the new energies as well. So solar panels increased in prices mm. earlier this year too. Uh, and that is also mainly related to sort of the cost of polysilicon coming out of China where costs were rising. Um, there was also some political tension around whether the US would buy polysilicon from certain regions of China. Um, so, you know, oil isn't the only thing that, that can go up. But in terms of the sort of the Chinese lockdowns, I wouldn't predict Chinese policy or, <laughs> uh, or anything to do with the coronavirus. Um, but certainly the picture for oil remains incredibly sort of volatile because it has a very, very powerful demand story in terms of the global economy in terms of lockdowns in terms of travel um, but it also has a competing narrative which is the sort of broad energy energy transition so what i always go back to is um what we'll see in oil is increased volatility and while i don't back it as a long-term investment there they'll sort of continue to be trading opportunities so we may see a huge supply shortfall in the next year or two um, for example people talk about how shale oil in america supply of shale which you can measure by sort of the rig count uh, in the US on or offshore hasn't rebounded in line with oil prices so you'd expect as oil prices go from 30 to 60 dollars a barrel and past 70 in the last month that 
you know, shale, which can switch on and off quicker than most, would ramp up very quickly. But they're under so much sort of pressure from uh, the sustainability uh, lobby, from investors and from banks and finances, that they haven't really been ramping up. So people are worried there's going to be a huge short shortfall in supply. So that could see a huge spike in prices in the next year or two. But the long-term view that I hold is still that as you know, the world relies on less and less oil. You know, one projection I think from the IEA was for us to go from 100 million barrels a day to 25 million barrels a day in 2050. Uh, so that's the next 30 years. That only the 25% of the cheapest oil that exists will be sold. And so that's the sort of the oil from Saudi Arabia that can be produced at nine bucks a barrel. Um, rather than the Canadian tar sands that require sort of 60 bucks a barrel. Um, so that's the sort of the long term story, I think, is one of falling prices where only the cheapest oil gets sold. So it could be 10 or 20 dollars a barrel. But for the moment, we're looking at supply shortfall. So just the sort of competing short and term, short and long term narratives, I think, are very interesting with oil. It's a, it's a fascinating space at the moment if you are watching it closely. Absolutely. So it's uh, definitely an, an interesting market to keep an eye on uh, for investors. Well, that has uh, consumed most of our time for this week's podcast. Thanks again, Kit, for joining me. Uh, we'll be back again next week with another Exponential Investor podcast. Thanks for tuning in and we'll speak to you then. Bye for now.